All right, so the first article we have is, we've seen this format before, it's a consent article asking that several items be taken up by the town and voted. These include reports from the select board, school committee, and other town officers, boards, and committees. Um, the establishment of the salaries and compensation of all elected officials. And that begins in the next fiscal year. So since most of this budget is for FY25, or most of this is for FY25, um, that the town acknowledged the monetary gifts made to the made to the town in appreciation for services rendered. And we made a little bit of a change to these to this table after some consultation with the select board. And so I do apologize, it's a little bit small, but um, I was trying to fit it into the framework I had for the slides. So we will include this in the warrant. So you will be able to see it in the warrant. All right. And then the last sections of article one include the vote to transfer the interest earned for the, from the Dickinson Library Trust to the Tilton Library and to Frontier Regional School Library. And you'll see the split which is the table. Um, it is a little bit more than last year, right? You? Yeah, oh, much more than last year. Okay. That's good. Um, these last several are the vote to authorize the select board to apply, accept, and expend monies provided by the state, either in grants or programs, which might be awarded to the town, and also to vote to authorize the select board, and actually there's something missing here, the select board and the assessors to negotiate contracts. So I missed a piece here, sorry. There should be an F and a G. Um, each, as you know, most years, each, there, there's a separate vote for both the board of assessors and the select board to negotiate and enter into contracts for a term of no more than five years. So apologize, I apologize for the mistake, but. It, it's in the warrant. Okay, so article two. This is also a fairly routine article that we do, and it's the request to transfer from free cash for special appropriations for the next fiscal year. And in this case, you'll see a little bit of a change. We have $100,000 for the reserve fund, $41,071 for other post-employment benefits, otherwise known as OPEB and $104,000 for tuition and transportation expenses for students to attend Smith Vocational and Agricultural High School. Okay. Article three, this is a, one of our routine articles and this is the request to fix the maximum amount that may be spent during the upcoming fiscal year for the revolving funds as they're established in the bylaws. And there's three routine revolving funds, one's recycling, one's parks and recreation, and one's the planning board revolving fund. And you'll see in certain places, finance committee has made their recommendations. There's other recommendations that are still pending that you won't see until the guide comes out prior to town meeting. Article four, this is so not my favorite but it is. <laughs> okay, so the intent of this article is to delete the entire chapter of the personnel bylaw and replace it with the language that you will see both in the bylaw or in the warrant and in this PowerPoint. And really that intent stems from the fact that this is a very old bylaw. It's very outdated and frankly, personnel administration needs to be managed much more quickly than it can be if there's a bylaw as opposed to a manual. So by making this change, the purpose is to create a personnel administration system in the form of a policy manual. So there's several sections and I'll start with this first one which is essentially to tell you we're establishing, if this were to pass, we would establish a system of personnel administration um, under the auspices of this language. 
Um, in the second section, it shows you the statutory authority and then the applicability. And so in this case, all departments and positions are subject to the provisions excluding elected officers and anything that might be subject to collective bargaining or other employment agreements um, that have separate language. Sorry, this is so small. It's pretty. It's a pretty long section or pretty long item in this section. So 35.4 basically says that these the intention of this change is to supersede prior versions of the personnel bylaw. And then 35.5, this is the main real discussion point that the personnel board had last week. And it's the composition, selection, and terms of office for the personnel board. Um, so in this case, we're talking about the personnel board consisting of six members. The select board would appoint two members for staggered four-year terms, which is consistent with what the bylaw says now. Um, the moderator would appoint one member for that, for that appointed for the four-year term, consistent with what the select board would do. This change maintains the finance committee appointment of one of its members to the personnel board annually, which is exactly what it says in the bylaw now. Um, and then those four members are residents of the town and shall not be employed or elected officials of the town other than finance. Um, the fifth member, and this, this was a change that was discussed at length, the fifth member of the personnel board shall be elected by a majority of town employees covered by the personnel bylaw classification and compensation plan to serve a two-year term as the employee representative. The employee representative, it, it, now I have to tell everybody, personnel is having a hearing on this on the 23rd. They still can make changes and any changes would show up in the guide. But right now, this is how it reads. Um, the employee representative would be a voting member, but shall not serve as a member of the personnel relations review board. There's a reason for that. I'll get to it later. Um, and as is current right now, the town administrator serves in an ex officio and non-voting capacity to the personnel board. And really the reason is, is to provide access to management. So it's the administrative connection and assistance to the personnel board with background materials and stuff. So all six appointed and elected members serve without compensation and they continue to hold office until their successor has been appointed and duly qualified. In the absence of a personnel board, the select board shall act in lieu and may appoint a mediator or independent third party to address issues involving personnel actions by the select board. Um, a quorum, and this was a key piece that was discussed, a quorum of the board shall be required for a meeting of the personnel board of the quorum present, which may include ex officio members, a simple majority of the board excluding the ex officio members shall be required to take any action. What this is intended to solve is issues when we don't have a full board and in other words, we have vacancies and have to have as many of the members as possible at meetings to conduct meetings and take action, which is what we're running into now. Personnel board can't hold a hearing unless they have three members present because they're the only three members that exist and can vote. So this was this was actually an ask on my part to sort of clarify what that looks like. And it was something that personnel board discussed. Um, there is also a, a portion of this paragraph that says, the select board may remove a member of the personnel board before the expiration of that person's term of office. And they would, uh, the person that that could be removed would receive a copy of the reasons for such removal, could contest the same before the select board, and could have a hearing, which is pretty standard language for a removal in similar situations. Um, but this is not something that we have currently. And I was asked about whether that should be included or not. Um, so this is something that I think we'll have a little bit of discussion next week. Um, there's also an absence piece here. So if the absent, if a member is absent for 25% of regular meetings, that's a reason for a removal. All right, so the next piece is powers, duties, and responsibilities. As you most, many of you know, personnel board is responsible for the classification, compensation, 
And essentially that classification goes toward wages, salaries, and you know, determining jobs as they relate. So compensation study, essentially. Um, and this is very similar to what exists now. Um, they also would be responsible for preparing proposed personnel policies for town employees, except those filled by election and such. Um, it also identifies the framework of a classification plan, which is minimum maximum salaries in positions so classified and for the attainment of those maximum salaries with periodic step rate increases. That's the framework of our current, current class comp plan. They work through the classification piece by looking at employees in their compensation groups and classes. And I think that might be, I don't know. Oh, there is one thing that stays, there is another thing that stays the same. They are authorized to employ professional consultants, although I think I did that for them this year. Um, here's the key piece. 35.6 is the establishment of personnel policies. This identifies the framework of policies that would be created in a manual. They include, but are not limited to, a method of administration, a method of recruitment and selection, classification compensation plan, a centralized record keeping system, personnel rules and regulations, which indicate the rights and obligations of the employees, disciplinary procedures, and other elements that are deemed necessary. And I will call out a comment that came up two days ago at the joint budget meeting, which was what happens if we don't have something, if this gets approved and we don't have something July 1st? Well, that's not our intent. And I have told the personnel board this several times, but I had the opportunity to share this with the member of the finance committee that asked the question. And really between, if this was approved between now and July 1st, we strip the benefits and the policies that currently exist in the bylaw, put them in a manual and start the process of adding in the elements that we do not have. And, that framework is the way we start things. So nobody's left hanging. Um, there are other things that we can add. And in fact, we have a report from the Edward J. Collins Center at UMass Boston, where they evaluated all of our policies existing and in the bylaw and gave us a recommendation for things that need to be revised, that we need to be added, and that could be um, tweaked a bit. So we have that framework ready. It's a question of, I think, my interpretation of the question at the joint budget meeting was, what are you going to do? Well, this is what we're going to do, and we will add to it as we go. Um, was there anything that you wanted to add to, to any of that? Because I know we had talked about it last night as well. I, I just want to say that um, this is we'll correct some of the issues with SCEMS and our um, by lab policy, because as a 24 seven operation, it's hard to have them under our bylaws. So um, this will be um, helpful on overtime. All right, we'll keep going. Here was a question that came up as well. And how do you, it was really, how do you adopt personnel rules and regulations? And there were some comments that as we were progressing with the warrant, that had come from several members of committees. Um, essentially, we would create a method to adopt rules and regulations, starting with personnel board, but not limited to personnel board. So a member of the select board or any appointing authority or two or more employees could suggest rules and regulations. I certainly suggest them on a regular basis as I learn things. So it isn't the end all be all that it's the personnel board, but it is in fact um, a framework by which we can start establishing those rules and regulations. And that's a key responsibility for the personnel board as we, as we consider a potential change of this nature. And so the way that they would do that is they would develop the rules or regulations for consideration 
um, they would pass those along to the select board. They would certainly look at their own, but they would pass those along to the select board and they would hold public meetings. So personnel board would hold a public meeting on their proposed rules. And then um, we would post those in prominent work locations to notify people. We also actually put stickers on people's pay stubs, warning them when there's gonna be a change in any potential change, class comp hearing, or even when it's open enrollment, everybody gets a sticker on their pay, pay stub that's, that ha would be affected by this. Um, so within a reasonable amount of time, is that me? No, it could be that somebody just opened their computer and, and it's feeding back. Oh, it's probably um, Julie. <laughs> once the personnel board's gone through a review of something they would like to send forward for consideration, they would make that decision and determine whether it needs to be recommended for adoption by the select board. So the second piece of this is action by the select board. And the select board is the hiring or appointing authority under the general laws. So there's an element that both boards play. So personnel transmits, the select board considers and may adopt them or adopt modified versions. Um, but if the select board fails to act, recommendations and regulations shall be deemed adopted upon the expiration of 45 days from the date of transmissal, transmittal to the select board. Um, but there's another piece here that it, I thought it was important to call out because there was a question and that's in the event that the select board determines that prompt action is necessary, i.e. an emergency, they, sh they need to be able to make changes if necessary. And everybody saw that in COVID. We had to make a lot of changes, both internally and externally to meet the needs of the employees, but also um, to provide for the health and safety of the community. And the select board had to do that. They had no other choice. Um, so although I don't think there would be too much dis discussion or dissemination between the two parties, I do think that calling this out identifies the fact that those things happen. Um, once rules are adopted, they get posted and an official record stays with the clerk. Here's the piece where I talked about the personnel relations review board. This exists as it stands in our bylaw. Um, what this explains a little bit better is that the personnel board serves as an authority to adjust grievances for full and part-time employees, um, other than school committee and uh, collective bargaining agreement processes. And it's funny because most of the language here is exactly the same but the word grievance gets construed, gets some clarification here. Um, and certainly if it has anything to do with the contributory retirement appeal board, that's a different story. But we wanted to make sure that we were a little clear, that we were clear about what that board does. And then the last piece is just severability. It says, you know, if a chapter provision is held invalid, the remaining provisions of the chapter shall, shall not be affected. So, that's essentially the outline. Was there anything you think I forgot, David? I know you'll have questions next week, but um, yeah, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but a lot of people haven't heard all these conversations. Okay, and then Art Five. This is the class comp. So the class comp does have to be ad adopted regardless of whether the personnel bylaw changes. Um, and that's because during the review that will happen after town meeting, if it does get approved, the attorney general reviews that. They may not be done by July 1st for their review of the a potential change to the personnel bylaw. So we have to have a class comp plan in place no matter what. And right now it has to be approved by town meeting. Um, so I'm sorry, this is small. I tried to make it as big as I could. Um, <laughs> it's I'm sorry, it's just really small type. Um, essentially, this is the class comp that was discussed by personnel board back in December. I tried to open. They have a formal hearing on it. 
I couldn't find it anywhere, and for whatever reason, I just Googled Deerfield. I muted him. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. So the things that have changed in the class comp, personnel board voted a cost of living adjustment of 2% in December, and that was the, the amount that we used to rebuild our class comp. So every year when we create a cost of living adjustment, that gets plugged into this table. And so it starts, everything gets adjusted by 2%, but the year over year adjustment exists at two and a half. So the total increase is four and a half percent potentially if it's approved. Um, and I don't, many people won't know, but several years ago, we did a classification compensation study and spread out the number of steps in our compensation plan. And actually in those year over year steps, we actually decreased the percentage, um, down to two and a half percent. So if you add cost of living plus that two and a half, you get to four and a half percent. There's no employee evaluation. It is. And so that's a that's a piece of changing the personnel bylaw that would allow us to create a manual and start implementing those pieces because a merit system doesn't exist. I'll be honest with you. A merit system doesn't exist. And we need to have those elements in and available to address measuring employees' performance. And so to your point, yes, that's the case. But the whole point and the whole intent of making this change is to start putting these things in place so that we can correct issues. All right. There we go. Article six. So now we're getting into two articles that are usual. We often see that we have to fund a shortfall in snow and ice removal expenses. So this year we are requesting $30,000 to be transferred from vocational education. And the reason is we had planned for several students this year, but there were several that actually weren't able to matriculate into the Smith Voc program. So we have money left over and we're trying to balance the use of free cash with the money that already exists. And this is an FY24 um, bill, but because it's related to the school, there's a preclusion where you can't transfer between a school account internally. So we're asking town meeting to approve this transfer. Article seven is a request to transfer funds to pay for three bills. The first one is a series of bills that are FY23 and they're for testing services at the old Deerfield wastewater treatment facility. Unfortunately, there was a mailing issue and we didn't receive them until very late. So we had to wait to put them on annual town meeting to get hopefully approval for it. The second one is, and so that's $1,726.84. The second one is $397.20. And that's to pay um, various individuals for overtime earned in FY23 and a portion of FY24 under the Fair Labor Standards Act. I'm sorry, 22, we paid 24. Um, so we found that there was a calculation error in how we were calculating payroll um, overtime in particular for several employees in SCEMS. Um, so this we did, we consulted with council and create a calculation framework to go back and make this right. And we did a two year look back. So what you see in that $397.20 is the two year look back from the time that we fixed the problem and had to make the calculations. We have to make everybody whole. So we're, we did the calculations thanks to Sarah um, and are ready to pay that out. Now that money would come from retained earnings, SCEMS retained earnings. Um, and then this last piece of it is a vote to transfer $376.64 from free cash to pay an FY23 bill for publication costs. It was for a hearing that the hearing applicant refused to pay. 
Um, so we do need to pay our bills. So we, I asked the board to include this on the warrant after the accountant asked me. So Article 8, this is a request to transfer from free cash the sum of $32,214. And that is money received for our opioid settlements that we didn't have a place to put. At the time we received them, they came in in 23. So we let them roll into free cash, understanding that we were going to have to fix this now. Um, one of the reasons that we waited to do this is the legislature and DOR were trying to work out a method to make it easier to be able to use the funds. And you can only, what you see in this article are the exact ways and means you can use these funds. They're very specific. Um, and at this point, we don't have anything to use them on. We haven't developed a plan for that yet, but we do need to take it out of free cash and put it into a special fund, which was established after the legislature and DOR sat down and hashed through a method they thought was workable for everybody. So that's what this is intending to do. Article nine, it's the omnibus budget. Hey, Julie, would you like to talk? <laughs> I do have a screen, I do have a Adobe document of the budget, but I thought I would, I knew you had a plan and you had a, you had something you- If I can um, share my screen. I believe Chris can do that for you. You should be able to, Julie. I just ask a quick question on sure. article six, please. Mm -hmm. um, it's from the vocational education appropriation. Yep. That is FY24 balance remaining, correct? Yes, that is okay. halfway 24 right. balance remaining. Thank, thank you, you Margaret. Thank you. I'm sorry I didn't make that clear. They they um didn't allow as many kids in to Smith Folk. This is Smith Vocation. Yes, yeah. right. vocational education, yep. Okay, hi everybody. Um, so we voted the last piece of the budget on Tuesday. Um, so we are kind of, uh, up against the last minute. So this is a presentation based on what we talked about through Tuesday. Um, it is my summary of what we did. I haven't, I, I got some discussion from the finance committee, but this is not necessarily the opinion of every soul on the finance committee. But basically what we do, we go through, we estimate the revenues, and then we look at the budgets and we go through every single budget line item with the appropriate department head or committee person or whoever. And then we look at the budget as a whole, how much has been asked for and how much money we have. And then we do some discussions about how to make those two numbers jive. Um, and then we go through and we review every warrant article um, on, the, on the warrant and, and make recommendations. Um, primarily from a financial point of view, since we're the finance committee, but we do go through and are required to look at every warrant article. So I'll take you quickly through what we talked about. If we look at revenues change from FY24 to FY25, our revenues come from kind of five main sources. Property taxes are pretty obvious. We do get some money from the state. Most of that is for the schools. Um, but we get some money from the state. We have local receipts. Those are things like your excise taxes, your um, meals tax, meals tax, that kind of thing. So it's, it's local, <laughs> local taxes that are not property taxes. We have free cash. Free cash is pretty much the kind of the balance in the checkbook from last year. So it's additional um, money we received beyond what we estimated we would um, from things like local receipts. And then if we, um, it, it's also money that we didn't spend on stuff that we had budgeted last year. So if we had budgeted a certain amount in the line item and didn't spend it all, that extra money rolls into free cash. That money is then available in the following year. Um, and it's supposed to be, it's kind of one-time money that's supposed to be spent on one-time expenses. And you'll see as we go through this that we're not really perfect at doing that. Um, and then the other category is a, a couple of small things. So it, it's uh, 
I don't know if we, so it's indirects, um, the, the work that is done here in town hall to support organizations that are uh, across several towns like South County Senior Center, SCEMS, that kind of thing. The work that our folks do to support that is then put back onto those individual budgets. And so that the, the money for that effort gets split across all of the towns involved instead of just being paid for by Deerfield. That's one piece of it. Um, overlay coming back is another piece of it. Um, couple, there's a couple of small things, that just, but it is sort of little miscellaneous stuff. Um, so if you, you can look at that, at the percent change in each of those categories, if you look in the top right-hand corner, you can see that property taxes are the vast majority of what we bring in is 75% of our, our revenues, our property taxes. Um, just to talk about Proposition 2.5 briefly, Prop 2.5 limits the increase. The, the sort of generic description is Prop 2.5 limits the increase from one year to the next to 2.5%. So if we look at the example of, of how that is actually applied, we look at last year's levy, if not including um, excluded debt, right? So there's a couple things that we've voted to spend on that is outside of Prop two and a half that requires a vote at town meeting followed by a, a vote at the ballot. And if it passes both of those, it's excluded. Um, and our excluded debt right now, there's there's some for Frontier Regional, although that is being paid off in FY25, so that loan will go away the highway garage and the wastewater treatment plant. We've voted the library, but it hasn't, we aren't paying towards that yet. So that doesn't show up in this amount. Um, all right, so back to the beginning. FY24 levy was $13,316,510. We add two and a half percent to that. That's that 332,913. We then estimate how much new growth we think is gonna be in the town next year, we add that value and that gives, that's the levy that we're allowed to um, levy <laughs> this this year um, in FY25. And then we add the excluded debt to that and that's how much we're gonna pay against each of those bills. So that total levy is 14421080 So if we look at just the non-excluded part, that's a 3.63% increase. Um, if we look at the total levy from last year to the total levy this year, that's only a 2.9% increase. That's because the amount we're paying on excluded debt is less than year the, this year than it was last year. Everybody's good with that? All right. Expenses. Um, so we've had, um, everybody has seen this probably in your own personal expenses, but we have some external stressors that we have no real control over. One is utility costs, um, electricity, heat, sewer, all of that is going up. Um, benefits and insurance went up a lot this year. It's like 20% increase somewhere in that neighborhood. Um, so we saw a huge increase in benefits and insurance. Uh, the next line, every we say this every year, but the baseline personnel costs increase faster than 2.5%. So just our class comp plan, if everybody goes up one step, they get 2.5%. We put a cost of living increase on top of that, a 2% this year cost of living. So there's 4.5% on most of the people who are under the class comp plan. We have a number of um, people in town who are under a... Uh, contract instead of a, the class comp plan, but they see a, a similar increase in their salaries. Um, so personnel kind of across the board are, are going to be greater than two and a half percent. So in addition to those, we have seen some specific um, changes within the con in, within the budget, and I'm going to just run through those quickly. Um, and if y'all have questions, maybe somebody else can help me answer, them, but we'll see. So there, there was a, a pretty significant increase in SCEMS this year. We have new management into SCEMS. Um, they are looking at, and it sounds like th they are looking at ways to become self-sufficient, to get it down so that 
they take in revenues that cover much closer to their full cost than they have in the past. And we're already seeing month by month, we are seeing increases in those revenues. There's a couple of things they want to do um, to achieve that. One of the items you'll see in the capital plan is to buy a, what do they call it? Intercept, vehicle? intercept, vehicle, intercept yeah. vehicle, but that allows them to respond to more calls without tying up an ambulance. So they can send a paramedic. I don't have the terminology, right? You can fix it for me. <laughs> EMT, a paramedic, which, whichever it is, paramedic. but they can send somebody to respond without having to take an ambulance with them, which provides like additional support to other towns. And we get revenues for that. So we get paid back. Um, and there's some other, there's some personnel changes um, within it. They're, they're, they have done their training outside of their normal hours instead of paying the folks um, while they're doing their training. So there's some changes in the way they, they're doing overtime in order to do training. And there's the, the new director um, uh, salary is, is higher than the old director. Um, I think those are the changes. There are, we'll move on to the next line. There are two key positions, um, senior positions in the town that we expect to turn over within the next year. Um, our town accountant and our highway superintendent both plan to retire within the next year. I don't know how we're gonna survive without our accountant, but we will, um, I'm sure you will find a, planning. a new plan for that. <laughs> but, but because of those turnovers, there are some extra funds in the, in the, budget to allow some overlap. So we get the new person in and we get that person trained up and experienced before the old person leaves. Um, so there is there are a couple of increases in the budget that we would expect to um, cover that, that period. Um, third line item, over the past several years, there have been quite a few changes in personnel within the um, within town hall pretty much in what positions there are. We hired a new planner. We split the um, the town clerk and the um, collector treasurer. Um, and the we um, this has been several years, but we have an assistant town administrator. and the the roles of what everybody does and the hours that they're serving and and which because there's assistance to some of these positions and all of that is sort of still percolating out um and so we are seeing some increases in salary as we work through that um that process um fourth one this is actually in order you know there i didn't put dollar values on here because i ran out of time but um these are sort of in decreasing order of dollar value hit to the um, to the to the budget sheet. So as you go through, you'll see that. All right, fourth one, um, we are now required to do PFAS testing. So there is a it's like twenty thousand dollar increase or something to the um, what do you call that? There was an additional the landfill. landfill. Yeah, so this is landfill monitoring. There's a there's more test wells. We had to drill two new test wells last year, and then there's this PFAS testing. So it's a, a pretty significant increase yep. to that line item. Um, the senior center ha has an increase. They have increased their staff and the number of hours that their staff. I think it's the same number of people, but they have more hours. Last year, one of the people became benefited. Um, they went over, you know, over half time. Um, and so this year we're seeing um, a, a big increase in the retirement cost within that group. Um, they've also been very, very energetic at getting grants, which is great because a lot of their salary is covered by grants, but administering those grants costs quite a bit. And I mentioned before how we take the time that is the people in this office that they spend administering those grants and that goes back to that line item. So some of it gets paid by the other two towns in the senior center, but some of it gets paid by us. So that's where you see that increase in the senior center line item. The health inspector line on him has increased a lot of that, that some of it was increased in salary, but some of it was also increased in hours because there are more food trucks coming. Every time a food truck comes, if it leaves town and comes back, it has to be inspected again. So there's a lot of inspections going on in those fruit, food trucks. So we saw the health inspector line item increase. The police cruiser 
we buy a police cruiser every year. Um, and the, 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 just the price of the cruiser increased at 65,000 and this year, last year it was 55. Um, so we saw a lice there and then the legal expenses, um, increased. We pay a basic retainer for legal services that covers most of the legal services that retainer went up this year, but we also, we separately pay for, um, labor, anything to do with labor. Um, and we will have several contract negotiations this coming year. So we expect that um, price to go up for legal expenses. All right. If we look at the breakout by percentage, you can see here the uh, big, biggest, obviously, you can see the huge chunk of it is education. Um, this, uh, I think I say it on the next slide anyways, if, if we work down from education and you see general government, that's kind of the, the f most of the folks in this office, public safety is mainly police, but also the inspections department, public works is essentially the highway department that non that 5% non-school benefits. The gray section for education is the basic amount that we pay for education, but we also, just for purposes of looking in at this and the percentages, we put their benefits, what else? Um, the the, the again, retirement. like the indirect, we did essentially the indirect that this office puts into it, the school resource officer, the part of it that's not paid for by um, a DA and, and Eagle Brook, give us some money for that, um, but the, and Frontier. Um, but the part of that person's salary that's not paid for it, crossing guards, that kind of thing. So all of that was put into that gray section that's education. So if we go back to our little blue slot that's non-school benefits, those are benefits for people that are not associated with the school, as the line item says. If we include the school in that, it's more like 11%, just to give you a feel for that. And then we have debt service, SCEMS. The reason SCEMS is so small compared to something like police uh, it's about the same number of people and, you know, they're a full-time thing, but they have revenues, police doesn't. So um, that cuts that one down. And then culture and recreation is like the library and the rec department, that kind of thing. And human services is um, senior center and uh, the nurse, the veterans, that kind of thing. Um, I don't know. I think that's all I have to say about that. Um, here it is in dollar values. You can see from FY24 to 25 how much each of those different categories increased. Oh, here's the thing. So this slide is actually what's in the budget um, for each category. The previous slide had the discussion that we had about how we took those other things for the schools and put them in with the school section. Um, so this that note on the bottom says that I didn't do it for these numbers. I did it for that percentage number on the previous one. So if you add this up and do the percentage, you're not gonna get the exact same thing as the other one. And this is why. All right. If we look at the change from the 2024, the FY24 budget to FY25, um, as I said, benefits, the right-hand side is the percent change. The left-hand side is the dollar change. Benefits increased, oh, it's like 11%. All right, so if I take out benefits and I take out debt and I look at everything else, there's education, which was shy of $300,000 increase, and then non-education is everything that's not education, not debt and not benefits. So if we go back up here, it would be all of these things, human services, culture rec, um, public works, public safety, general government, all of that. Okay. We're good with that. Okay. Um, just because schools are such a big part of our budget, um, we broke out what it is by school. Um, so you can see the dollar value increase or decrease and the percent change for each of the schools. So you've got Deerfield Elementary, you've got Frontier Regional. Um, the Frontier Regional School budget 
everybody probably knows that, but is divided among the towns um, mostly by the number of students that each town sends. And it's a five-year rolling average. So our this year, our five-year rolling average dropped by either nine or 10 kids. Nine, okay. Um, which is why we're only at 1.8%. The, the total budget increased more than that, but our piece didn't increase that much because we have fewer kids, basically. Um, Franklin Tech, that number of kids increased by 10 kids, I guess, because I knew one was nine and one was 10. I can't remember which one was which. Um, Franklin Tech, we have 10 more kids going to Franklin Tech. Um, so that's why the huge increase there. Franklin Tech, um, I don't know if this is law or not, but they do a 3% increase in their budget every year. And then, so their baseline budget increased by 3%. It's always right on 3%, but our piece, you know, the piece that goes to each town is by the number, essentially by the number of kids that you send there. Um, it also has a, a, like a wealthiness factor in it, but, um, but there's a, an equation that they use to apply that. But that, I mean, it's a 38% increase, which is huge, but it's because we have so many more kids going there. Smith Vogue, as you mentioned earlier, Smith Vogue dropped because we think we're going to send fewer kids this year than we sent last year. Yeah. Um, because this is the education page, is this, would it be appropriate um, because it is a significant amount of money that taxpayers put into it? For school choice for children, I know the school get five thousand dollars for every child that enters mm -hmm. in the uh, town. However, it's costing taxpayers in Deerfield seventeen or eighteen thousand dollars per child to educate. So technically, taxpayers are paying twelve to thirteen thousand dollars for children who aren't. Yeah, sort of. So let, let's let's actually talk about that point just for a second. The pro it, if you take the total budget of the school and divide it by the number of kids in the school, then you come up with that number, 17, 18,000, 13,000, I don't know, whatever the number is, which is a lot more than 5,000. But that's not the incremental cost of one kid, right? If I take a kid, if I take one kid out and don't send them, the cost goes down essentially nothing, right? I still have a principal. I still have a janitor. I still heat the room. I still, you know, all of that stuff. So there's the incremental cost per child is not that 13,000, 17,000, whatever it is, um, right? Yeah. Most of the towns agree, and that's wrong. Most of the towns agree that's kind of two months of the class. So we're going to split that class into two, and then we're going to see that the class. And the almost three classes, the lack of better term, the native is here to work. So when we do that, we add five to the Actually, can you do that into a microphone? Because there's a shout way everybody online, you online. And I'm sorry. No, I, I forgot to. Uh, David, actually, this is a good explanation. Yeah. Uh, just trying to strong point out uh, whether each. Okay, that one's totally not working. Let's see if that one. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, there you go. That one works. Okay. Sorry to butt in, but just to the point about whether. Um, a choice child, say from Greenfield, costs us $17,000 to educate. It's important to think about it, I think, a different way, which is that uh, our elementary school is not um, supporting separate classrooms just to educate choice kids. So the way to think about it, I think, is a numbers game. And I'll do it a little bit more clearly. But if we have 30 Deerfield residents in second grade, 99% of this town is going to say that's too many kids for one class. So we're definitely going to have two second grade classrooms. 
with 15 kids each. I think the teachers would love that, but I think we all would agree they could probably teach three to four or five more in that class and still have a great class. So every one of those choice kids coming in to make the 31, two, three, four, or 35 kids in that grade is money for the town that's not increasing any costs to, um, to our budget. And you should also know, just from my experience on the school committee, we actually, the school has been reducing class, number of class room grades because of our decreasing population. So they're kind of making sure that we're not supporting an entire grade classroom uh, with choice kids, so. Yeah, so we are down to right now two classes per grade in every grade. And when I six, seven years ago, we were at three classes per grade. So they've dropped a lot and they've dropped obviously the teachers and everything. So go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, 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 that'd be great. Thanks, Charlene. <laughs> I was an educator for 37 years, and my last six years were as a principal in the small town of Irving. And I have nothing against school choice. I want to be clear on that. I'm just concerned about the taxpayer money that is used. And I understand filling classrooms and that. Um, but I have to tell you, the community that I worked in, which is nearby, uh, absolutely refused to do school choice because their uh, mantra was that all the tax money for the town of that particular uh, my, that particular town was to be dedicated to the children of that town. And Lexington and Concord and your very wealthy communities out in Boston, they choose not to do school choice for similar reasons. So I, I understand how we can maintain our staff and but I'm just saying, um, from a taxpayer point of view, there is an expense because that that uh, school choice money does not come to the town. You know that. It stays with the school. And I know the schools do wonderful things with that money, no doubt about it. But there is an expense to taxpayers because these other communities have seen that it could be detrimental and they have actually chosen not to do it. So it's just a point that I want to bring up. And, um, you know, I, I just feel if there is a serious amount of money of, for taxpayers dedicating to this, I've written a letter um, to the legislatures at, le legislators asking them to up the 5000 yes. for 30 years yes. it has stayed $5,000. And that's ridiculous. Uh, at that time, it was 7000 a child. And it's up. We all know everything's up. But um, I I know there was some thought that there might be movement on that. It 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 is due for you know after thirty years it is due for uh, an increase. So that's just my point. But I really have nothing against school choice. I understand its importance totally. But there are communities who have just put their foot down and said no, we're not doing it. So just wanted you to move that. Yeah. The, the other place it comes in is in Frontier because Frontier merges all four towns. And if there's a bunch of school choice kids in each of the elementary schools, they automatically get to go to Frontier. And then in Frontier, I think you probably are in the spot where you're having more classes than you would otherwise. It's... Um, I, I can argue both sides of it though, because then, but by having a larger high school, you have more opportunity and you can offer more different classes than you would be able to otherwise. But it's definitely, I, I would love to see a discussion uh, among the four towns in the union about possibly merging some of the elementary schools because they're, I, I mean, our, our population is dropping. Sunderland was two classes per grade. They're down to one class per grade in a lot of the grades, not all of them. Um, and and so we, I, I think it's right for looking at where there could be savings. Yeah. Go ahead, Jeff. Well, the same token. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Do the well, microphone I mean, thing. I was going to say, schools can be doing their part to support their budgets. Yeah. I mean, those two massive budgets, yeah. 1.4 and 1.8, are pretty... Uh, so they, they are pretty disciplined, to get, but if you look at the difference between when our kids were in the elementary school and where the elementary school is now, it's at like, 
they're like 300 kids. And when we were there, we were just shy of 500 kids. And that's been what, six years, eight years, right? So, and, and you're not seeing the budgets decrease, even though we're at 60% of the kids that there were. My concern is also OPEB. Nobody is funding OPEB. And we as Deerfield residents are on the hook for 51% of Frontiers OPEB and all of the elementary yeah. school. All of the elementary school. And that is really, really a serious issue. It's kicking yeah. can down the road. Um, I've been talking about this for years, but we also don't have a lot of extra money to fund OPEB. So, I mean, what are you going to do? But it is really a serious concern. The, a few are. Yeah, there are. We, we've brought this up at the MMA because, yeah, well, Lennox, Lennox and Stockbridge and a few. I mean, there are, because we've talked about this on the uh, MMA level, and it is a really serious concern, but I mean, everybody's in the same boat. How are you, I mean, this, the dollars that we get from the state, this is the actual dollars for local aid is almost now this coming to the same as it was in 2008. That gap that we had in dollars from 2008 to now that we're just getting to that 2008 level has been made up by the taxpayers. And that's why there's no real appetite to try to figure out how we're going to fund these obligations that are down the road because there's just no ability to fund it from the taxpayers. And, and one of the most critical things is that you cannot run a town without getting grants. Everything we do in this town is, is really funded by grants. But there's a cost to grants and you know so i'm just saying that what we have happening we have less aid when i first was elected select board we went to boston on a bus charlene probably remembers this and we're complaining because the state was cutting back on student student cost of funding the cost of education to about 33 percent we're now less than 20 percent from the state. It's pretty crazy. And who's made up that gap? The taxpayer. And that's why uh, there's so much um, issues with trying to, you know, working. We work so hard to get a balanced budget. It's very difficult because your growth, as Julie pointed out um, already, the growth, the percentage growth, and then your new growth is very small. You're talking three or 400,000. Well, that doesn't even costs cover your personnel costs in the in the in a year so you have to figure out we've been very creative we've been figuring out all kinds of stuff we're lucky that we have regular free cash but we are not covering our operational budget and 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 that's why there's so much stress on the taxpayer jeff you had a question I'm good. you're good all right. <laughs> um, these are the capital expenses that were voted this year. Um, if you look at that first column where it says free cash, what we're paying for out of our own free cash money is um, air conditioning. They're going through and installing air conditioning in the elementary school. Um, this is the second phase of this. They'll do six rooms this year. They did a bunch of rooms last year. Um, there is a server replacement. That's the server for town hall. And then all the way down on the bottom line, the senior center van. Senior center got a grant to cover a, a large handicapped accessible vehicle. Um, so the 12500 is our portion of the part that's not covered by the grant. I think the grant's for like 80, 85%, yeah. something like that. Yeah, yeah about 85% of the, of the yeah. cost of the vehicle. Um, all right. So other than that, um, the wastewater treatment facility um, would like to replace their current truck with a new truck. They got a really good trade in value for the truck that they are replacing. Um, so they are getting a F-350 
um, that uh, will be able to plow. And so they'll be able to plow themselves instead of having the town come and plow them. So that's what that one is. That will come out of the wastewater treatment facility retained earnings. Um, and then SCEMS um, has several items that they're doing. They're getting a replacement stretcher that will come out of retained earnings. This pair, pair oh, I can't type. Paramedic intercept vehicle um, will be partially from retained earnings and partially from, um, oh, I can't see that. A project um, reallocation from project reallocation. So they they had some funds that were that were set aside last year for a um, uh, a capital project that they were able to fund through grant money. So the the funds that were set aside for that will be, um, assuming it's voted, will be reallocated for this um, paramedic intercept vehicle, um, and then the uh, another portion of that funding will be reallocated for an alert system in the um, station. And then uh, the, the intercept vehicle will be an electric vehicle. Um, the charger for that electrical vehicle will be funded from the SCEMS rent stabilization fund. Um, so SCEMS pays rent to Deerfield every year. 75% um, of that rent is set aside into a stabilization fund. The money in that fund can be used for improvements to the building, changes to the building. So this was considered a change to the building, so it will be funded out of that. Um, I think Pam Predmore oh. had a question on the, uh, I saw her hand raised when. Yep. Yeah, I do. Um, it's, it's a request. Those of us attending on Zoom cannot hear the questions that are coming out of the audience there. It's impossible for us to understand them. Please request that they come up and use the mic. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Okay. Um, the other thing we do is we look at financial indicators. Um, we did not do the full financial indicator review this year, but we did look at a couple of things. Um, one of the items we look at is the average single family tax bill. That seems to be a good way to compare our taxes to other towns' taxes. So basically what it is, if you take the total value of uh, assessed value of all single family properties in Deerfield, and add that up and then divide it by the number of single family properties in Deerfield, you get the average value. Um, and then we apply our tax rate to what that average value is. And that's what we call the average single family tax bill. In Deerfield, our fire department is not through municipal taxes. Um, I mean, it's not through the, whatever, the, the municipal omnibus budget, it's separate. Almost all the other towns in um, Massachusetts do not do that. So we add back into this value what we're paying for. I, I use the South Deerfield rate. So the South Deerfield fire and the South Deerfield water district are added to this. So these numbers you're looking at here include that extra um, for the, the fire and water, okay? Um, so this is, if you look year on year, 2014 through 2024, this is the percent change in our average single family tax bill over the years. So you can see for the past several years, we are four-ish percent. Last year was five, right? Um, what is this? So this is dollar value, not percent increase. So if you look at the orange line, these are real dollar dollar values, and you can see that it increases every year. If we include the impact of inflation, that's what the blue line gives us. So if you include inflation, I, they didn't, I don't have a CPI number for this year yet. So this is like last year's dollars, not this year's dollars. Um, but the past couple of years, it has been fairly steady inflation adjusted. That doesn't really help anybody's pocketbooks any, but it, it gives you another piece of data to look at. Um, if we look at our single family home tax bill compared to other towns, so this is the full state, all 351 towns. Um, we're right there in the middle. It, it's pink, but it's really hard to see. So I put an arrow on it. So you can see we're, we're pretty much right in the middle, um, 166 out of 351 towns. 
Um, if we look at Western Massachusetts, so it's the four Western Massachusetts counties, we are number 11 out of 101 towns, right? Um, the two high ones there on the right are Amherst and um, Longmeadow. Just Pelham. Pelham. No, Pelham is the third one. Amherst oh, doesn't have Amherst a name on it. So that, that oh, second Amherst tall one is actually Amherst. Yeah. Cool. And if you look way down to the left, like Hancock, but um, you see down there it will be like uh, Roe and Monroe and stuff. And they have really large um, I mean, uh, commercial um, projects. So their budgets are a lot higher than you would expect with that low tax rate. But their tax rate is really low because they have this huge commercial. Um, I think well, Irving might be. Irving and might, Roe. Yeah, and Roe and Monroe, I think, all have that kind of thing. If we look just at Franklin County, we are the second highest in Franklin County out of the 26 towns in Franklin County. <laughs> um, this gives you a visual of where we are. If we were in Eastern Mass, which we are not, um, we would be 131st out of 148 towns. I took the five counties that sort of surround Boston. So um, their taxes are crazy, but their salaries are probably higher too. So anyways, um, the other thing we looked at is how much, the, this is too many numbers, but you can look at it later or something. So, so if you look at our omnibus budget, as we started this whole discussion off with um, raise and appropriate is a big part of it. And then there's some other small pieces that go into it. And then we use free cash to make up the rest. And that gives us our total omnibus budget. The EMS fund is not in the omnibus budget anymore. Um, in my opinion, that is a recurring expense though. And so we add that onto it. So we look at the total in that right-hand column, you can see the total that we use free cash and other for. Free cash is supposed to be one-time money for one-time expenses. And this is how much money we're spending on recurring expenses. So if you look at it graphically, here's just that free cash and other line. And you can see that, you know, we were working on it and we were bringing it down and we were kind of holding in there. And then well, we had a tough year this year and we used a lot of free cash for recurring expenses. Now, if um, a, a big piece of this out of 634, I don't know, 440 something is SCEMS. So if SCEMS can really pull that amount down and, and really, um, you know, get the revenues in to cover it. That will help us a lot here, but we are definitely putting, we've made some decisions over the past few years to increase personnel and to um, uh, pay um, people a, a good wage for the work that they do in the town. And, you know, there's some decisions that we've made. Those decisions all cost money and we're looking at that, that impact on where we are right now. Um, so this is the part that's really just me, not the whole finance committee, because I wrote this, I don't know, very late last night. Um, but just a couple of general comments. First is that the budget is legal. We reviewed every line. We talked to everybody about it. It follows the constraints. Everything has been reviewed and it is approved and recommended by the finance committee. We definitely have some concerns. One is what I just talked about. The amount of free cash we are using for recurring expenses is high. Because we are using that free cash for recurring expenses, we are not spending on capital expenses. So there were capital requests that came in that were not funded this year because we didn't have the money to do it. Um, personnel expenses are always a worry because personnel costs more than 2.5% a year in increase on average. Um, so that's, you know, there, there's nothing you can do about that. You just have to recognize that that's there. The school expenses are are high. They're a huge part of our um, of our budget. They The number of kids is decreasing. This is in no way a slam against the school because they are very disciplined. They really, they keep their budget down. They don't do huge increases. They plan their maintenance well. They have, you know, they, they are in no way acting poorly. It's just very challenging. And the amount of money we're seeing from the state is not increasing much. 
Um, it, it's just, it's a problem and it's something that we need to think about. Um, and I put this in there because I'm very worried about Brenda leaving us. <laughs> You're not the only one. We will find a new person and the new person will be good, but yeah. but we will all. And then um, the the promising item I put down there was the SCEMS plan for an improved revenue generation. I'm pretty sure, yeah, that's all I had. Pam, planned. Any fine. questions on any of that? Pam has a question. Oh, Pam, go ahead. No? Okay. Okay. Oh, oh no, it's Reed. It's Reed Pridemore. Okay. Oh. Reed, you have a question? Yeah, I think yeah, I think you ought to be concerned about the new highway superintendent also. Yes. Um, well, thank you. I th you it was a little garbled. I think you said that um you were just asking that if the highway superintendent, the highway superintendent does plan to retire this year, so we will be looking for a new highway superintendent. Well, I think you ought to emphasize the, the concern about that position also. Yeah. You understand me or not? Well, I'll, I'll type something in. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Brenda's not the only person that we're worried about losing. That's what you're saying, and that's it. Yes, we agree. So, Jeff, you had a question. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> Jeff Upton, and uh, very quickly, I think this was mentioned last night uh, at the select board meeting, but free cash on hand remaining going forward. Do you have a number on that? I believe it's 219. 219,557. 219, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. And the finance committee, do they have any thoughts as far as moving forward here for next year's budget? It looks it looks to me like we're spending down revenues in all categories to make ends meet. And is this looking like it's going to catch up to us? Uh, I, I'm, and I know you can't, you know, make great predictions or anything, but I, I, as I say, it, it just looks like our revenues. Jeff, you know, it's not control, sustainable. Right? It's not sustainable. We've been saying that for years. And so the only thing you can do is increase revenues. And I have to say, I feel like the SCEM situation that's had the biggest impact, it's a $444,000 increase, mm -hmm. um, we are changing. We're seeing that already. Brenda's seeing it. There is an increase in revenue. They've got really good ideas to make sure that um, SCEMS becomes a little bit less. Uh, I, I, will, I don't think we'll ever get to revenue neutral, but we'll definitely be able to decrease our um, assessment like it was before. There's just what happened this year is there was very little retained earnings to um, lower our assessments. So that's why it's so much higher this year. Yeah, I, I, um, We I, had no retained earnings, but I have to say, I've been working extremely hard uh, with a rural um, schools community group across the state. We have 218 towns that we're working together and we are trying to get uh, rural aid increased and that had a huge impact on the budget last year and went from 7 million to 15 million so we are continuing to work on that our goal is to get 60 million and that will have a huge impact that will try to get um it should be up to about if we get 60 million rural aid which is our goal and it's a goal it's not necessarily you know given the revenue situation at the state level right now, I don't think it's going to be achievable for three or four more years, but then we're going to be over 20% of the cost of students. And that's huge because we're under 20%. And like I said, the state has been decreasing to us um, their support over the last two decades. And that has had the hugest impact on our um, school, but you know, on our total budget, because it's such a large percentage of our budget. Right. 
there's nothing you can do about that unless you increase revenue. And we're doing everything we can to increase revenue. Mm -hmm. Where our meals taxes come up, we're doing, you know, if the um, Empowerment Act passes the governor's proposal, we will come to town meeting, we will increase the meals tax and the room tax additional 1%. You know, the trend is good, but you know, there's not much you can do unless you increase the revenue. So, you know, you brought that up. Hopefully you'll leave the excise tax alone. Yes. I don't think we have any intention of doing that, but we have, that would be great. we are doing a lot of stuff to promote Deerfield. Um, obviously Treehouse is having some impact mm -hmm. and um, that's a multiplier effect. So we're hoping to take advantage of that. Right. And I understand, I know we had this discussion uh, with Skims years ago, and I think Skims doing a great service for all our towns. Uh, but we did discuss and hope that we were going to move to, uh, you know, uh, revenue neutral as far as cost. Will that ever happen? I don't know, but it would be nice to see it moving in that direction. I think Matt can back me up right. but, and Tim, because they both sit on the boo board. Mm -hmm. But I would say that what we have done so far is hiring a new director um, it is very, very promising, as Julie said. Right. Um, it is going to happen, but you mm -hmm. he needs more than six or eight weeks here to right. really make a difference. But we're seeing it already. Yeah. And get back to something that Julie mentioned, and I agree with you, Julie, 100%. I think it'd be nice to eventually, in the very near future, have a discussion about uh, going regional with some of these elementaries. I know it's going to be very difficult, but it could be because of the declining population, it, we, it could be very cost effective. And I know it's a huge... You know, people don't like change and yeah. people like their own local school system. I understand that. But at some point in time, when you have uh, your revenues at 63 percent and and they are, I agree that schools, I thought for this year, they've done a great job keeping their percentages down. There's no question about that. But I really do feel and this is not a new idea. This was talked about five, six, seven years ago. And I I even said I'd be more than happy to sit on that committee if needed. Um, we, so. we did investigate that, um, as you know, probably like 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. And we had all, all kinds of meetings, but um, it never went anywhere uh, in Waitley or Conway. And those are the schools that have the highest school choice. and right that guarantees into the frontier, so. Right, and that can, right. school choice, I think David did an excellent, uh, excellent explanation of that. That has not always been. Uh, there were times, years here in the past that Deerfield taxpayers were definitely subsidizing school choice. Uh, and I brought that to their attention and there were some changes made several years ago on that. The frontier situation, when you take a look at the population, it, we're kind of forced into that situation because with school choice, we have them till they graduate. So that makes it very difficult. And well, other people probably understand this better than I, and probably Charlene could uh, explain it better, but we have a declining student population. We have public schools, we have charter schools, we have technical schools, mm -hmm. and all of those buildings are fixed cost issues. Right. Something's got to give at some point. And if all the students that were in charter schools were back at public schools, maybe that would help us a bit. I, I'm not arguing one way or the other because I know families need to make decisions based on what's best for their families. But you know, it's a complex problem, no question. Yeah, it is. We are in the fortunate position that we have good schools and that people want to come to them. Absolutely. It's a lovely thing. And I think it brings people to town too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, yep. part of it is because we're funding more than most of the other towns as far as our budgets. Yeah. And so we're providing more services than that, but it's also having an impact 
on the, sure. the taxpayers. So yeah. So it's a kind of a double-edged sword. I think I think several people understand that. Can I make a quick comment on uh, Article Four? Sure. Sure. Well, I'm, Actually, well, I'm here. I, get to that and I didn't want to interrupt in that. So, yeah. Can uh, I make a Jeff, quick comment before Jeff. you get to that? Um, okay. To your original question, which was, what does the Finance Committee think? Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what I think is that within the next couple of years, we are either going to have to have a Prop 2.5 override or we're going to have to cut something in our budget because we can't keep spending this much free cash and not spending anything on capital. Um, so, it, and and I, I think there, I, I, I don't know which way it will go. I, I'm hopeful, like if we can find good savings within the schools and we can find good um, new revenues within SCEMS, um, we can probably keep going for a, a few more years, but we need to. Um, Eventually it's going to catch up to us. Yeah. Yeah, that's my concern. Okay, also. New treehouse will um, bring. Yeah. Some Go ahead. Yeah, Margaret. Share your mic sure. for one second. I okay, think so. Julie's slide regarding stressors mm -hmm. was very clear that we we do have some stressors, and yes, our revenues, including one-time revenues, are being drawn down in order to fund a budget that is outpacing our revenues. Mm -hmm. uh, agreed, one hundred percent. Um, hang on just a sec, Jeff. Pam, is your question about the budget or is it for something else? No, this is just... Oh. So, um, my question is going to be about the school budget and the numbers of students attending whose parents live at the private schools because they don't pay, um, they don't pay real estate taxes. Um, and I'm so it's related to that, and I can wait um, for the rest of my my thinking and question on that. Okay. Are you, you do, are you done with your finance questions? I mean, okay, yeah. so um, maybe she should do this. Is this a finance question, Pam, or is this a general um, town warrant question? This is a question about. The school budget. Um, I'll mm. try to be as brief as possible. I'm wondering if we know how many number two questions. What does it cost to educate an individual child in our school system? Two, how many of those students live in housing, presumably with their parents, that does not pay real estate taxes and therefore no money comes to the town through the state? for their education. And the reason that I mention this is that my daughter lives in a town that has two private schools. They're currently spending something like $70,000 per year per student where those students are not paying anything into that town through real estate taxes. How does that calculate for this town? Quite a bit. I and I and I am I will just also say that I am familiar with the pilot program payment in lieu of taxes that is done by some of our um some of our private schools but how does that what they donate to the, <clears throat> to the town how does that compare to the cost of educating their children in our public school system it doesn't. It doesn't. Yeah. What do you mean by it doesn't? I mean, so are, it doesn't cost the town anything to educate asking? these children because you're not getting money from the state towards their education. Pam, are you asking how many students per year come from uh, non-taxpaying schools? It was, it, it was two questions, Tim. Okay. One question is how many students... Yes, you're right. How many okay. students are in our our school system who currently whose family currently does not pay through real estate taxes for their education? I mean, and how do you compare that to what money the town does in fact receive either in cash or in 
some form of like what's the work that's, that uh, has been done on the congregational church? So um, I don't have an exact figure, but I know that we talk about between 40 and 45 students coming from the Mint, Eagle Brook, and DA, depending on what you believe the per cost student cost is. If it were 40 students and you were using a $17,000 per student cost, it would be $680,000. And we do not, at least in the annual gift point, we do not receive $680,000 from the nonprofits. Nope. So um, it's certainly something that we talked about last night. Um, Charlene Galinsky raised a question about pilot. What everyone needs to understand is pilot is a voluntary um, payment. The state has pilot, which is for forested land and for uh, land that the state actually owns in our town and our communities. And they don't really pay a lot, but at least they have a formula and they pay. Um, for non-taxable entities like hospitals and schools, this is all voluntary. And in school's case, um, that's the biggest effect on our community. Um, we can ask, but they have no obligation to agree. That's right. Um, I explained to uh, Charlene last night that there is a group in town that is working with um, Senator Comerford, uh, Reps uh, Dom and uh, uh, Whips. They're not our representatives, but they are pushing for pilot. Pilot gets brought up within the, within the legislature every term, and it usually sits in committee because it's a tough question for people to to deal with. I mean, they 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 don't want to be caught. It's like it's talking about Social Security or Medicare. It's one of those issues that nobody can agree on. Um, but it would be lovely if we could get the state to allow each community to negotiate with their nonprofits and say, we want 25% of the assessed value of your real estate, or we would like to be able to negotiate with you a set amount every year that you're going to pay to the community. Um, but it's voluntary. And until we can get the state to buy into it, we're not, we don't have the power to force these nonprofits to actually contribute what they need to contribute. That's my personal opinion. Yeah, and 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 I agree with you absolutely. Um, I will just tell you that there is a growing number of people who are working with the state across the state. Um, on this issue to try to change that so that there will be more pressure put on these private schools who don't pay into our our real estate through our real estate taxes. And just one more comment and I'll let you go, but um, it's also my understanding that there are quite a few pieces of property that were tax paying that have, as they've come on the market, have been bought up by these private schools and therefore are taken off the tax rolls. And that's got to be an effect on you know affecting our budget as well. So thank you very much for, for all you're doing tonight. As, as Charlene has mentioned, we were testifying back when Steve Kulik brought these bills up earlier. We, we testify all the time at the Ways and Means. They just don't seem to get out of committee. Um, it, you know, and they don't even have an opportunity to get voted on by the House or the Senate, much less get signed off by the governor. It's very discouraging. We've done everything we can to um, lobby and contribute to the that process because that's part of the revenue issue is that we are actually losing taxable property as well as having uh, increased school costs. So um, can I can I say just to, I know it's, uh, it's approaching eight o'clock and um, we're now moving backward in the warrant rather than forward. So could you want to speak to something in, in section four and then article, can, four, article yes. four? Right. I didn't, I didn't want to interrupt before. I didn't know if it's going no, to. No, no, no. I just wanted to. As you went, but very, yeah. very quickly on article four, is that is that something that uh, needs to be done immediately or could that be for a special town meeting in the fall? The reason why I ask that is I just had a chance to take a quick glance 
as we we're going along here. So I didn't get a chance to read in depth on language and intent in that. And a few concerns, and I think Matt brought one up, you know, when we start talking about merit principles, what is going to be the evaluation system and how is it going to be implemented? And that really, from what I could see here, is really not explained. It looks like it's, I, I think in basic, it looks like it's a good work in progress, but it's not a complete item. And so here's the reason. The reason is, is we need the ability to create the system in a manual that is flexible. Yeah. If we continue to use a bylaw, we are out of legal compliance. That is the bottom line, Jeff. Okay. We are out of legal compliance because we only have two shots to make any changes in the bylaws. Mm -hmm. And every time we try to make changes, I don't remember, I don't know if you remember like 10 years ago, we had a huge change in the bylaws. Right. And it took three times to get it through. Right. So what we're trying to do is create more flexibility and a process that is an open process. Everybody has a chance to come to these meetings. We have to publicly post and mm -hmm. everyone knows it. Um, but also alleviate some of the cost concerns, because I'll tell you, the postings we have to do for the two hearings that are required in the bylaw are over $400. Yeah. We're trying to make some changes that are thoughtful, that help us create a manual. And we know we may not start with every policy in place or every process in place, but what we will start with is a place to jump off. And there are policies available for many of my peers, mm -hmm. and we have access to some folks that can help us evaluate a manual. But frankly, this is we're an unusual group. There's very few communities left that work through a bylaw. Right. Most have changed to a manual. So they can address exactly what you said, right. a merit system. How do you evaluate these things? All these things have to be created and in place. And but they can't start all at once because the whole shebang can't start it all, all at once. It's right. just practically speaking difficult. Well, there's a lot of, uh, and I don't mean to, but I, I do want to say, obviously, a lot of work went into this. I just, I guess my concern as a resident and a quick look, and like I say, I haven't read this in depth, obviously. There isn't a, there isn't a procedure in the bylaw right, right now. Right. For but, any of those things. Right. But I'm saying if we're going to go through that process, let's get that procedure in place. But my only thing is, and I'm sure you probably ran this by legal counsel, but my concern is just from looking at this quickly, it looks like it could leave the town open for some lawsuits. That's all. And that was just a quick the, look. I need to read through this language more in depth. So the bylaw creates a framework for a manual. The manual is where all those things live. Mm -hmm. I got and it. I all of that, that will go through right. council. And, you know, like I said, we have other places we can get some support. Right. But council looks at the thing. Right. No, I understand this. From it, a it just, perspective. Once again, it looks like we may be a little ahead of the game asking voters to approve this without a complete uh, so, um, definition. Like if we do what's done. being suggested by um, and Margaret made a great point at the finance she committee. Did. What we're proposing is passing this bylaw, if the voters approve it, immediately take the bylaws that exist, mm -hmm. place them in the manual and say, th these are the, the same things that we're under now. Right, we'll start the board. manual. Right. And after that occurs, we will no longer have to go to the legislature to change the, the manual right. so we can do things locally without expenditure and that address our local concerns. Mm -hmm. um, and we won't have to wait to annual town meeting. We won't have to wait to special town meeting. We won't have to wait till the legislature approves what we've changed. So, yeah, I mean, is this the exact moment? Would three months from now be better? That's a that's a judgment call. And I no, I just figure I bring bring it to your attention. That's all. Yep. Not, we're we're not aware of it, and actually, Margaret helped please. frame yeah, some yeah. of I that. Actually, actually, right. I, I, I agree with you. It could be done. Mention in, the language and yeah. give you. The language is intended to be a framework. It's not intended to hit every detail. Okay. 
Yep. Thank you. All right. I think we're on Article 10. So give me a sec. Yep. <laughs> Okay, so Article 10 is funding for the Sewer Enterprise Fund for fiscal year beginning July 1st, oh, 2024. Casey, you know what? Matt just had a question. Oh, Matt. sorry. I'm sorry, Matt. I didn't see you That's either. Okay. Well, Casey, I understand. Just to tag on to a couple of things that were said earlier, we're at a point where I think this discussion with the elementary schools is becoming more vital. We have an elementary school building today that we replaced a roof on at 20, about 25 years. We replaced that roof? Little, okay. Yeah. And that roof is now probably about 10 years old. So, okay. 2016, I think. Okay, so we're about 35 years into a building that typically has like a 50 year lifespan and we know nothing happens quickly. And we know these discussions will probably be two to three years. I can tell you from South County EMS, I believe it was a three year process to do that. And the leaders of those organizations were in agreement of what we wanted to do. We just needed to get there. We're dealing with schools where there's gonna be a lot of emotion. There's gonna be a lot of parents involved. There'll be people who don't want their kids going out of, out of their town, the four walls of their town for elementary school. But can these four communities afford in the next 15, 20 years to start the process of building new schools again? And more importantly, do we need to? I think there's probably a good opportunity here to begin those discussions with some financial parameters to explain to people, if you don't make these choices now, here's what it's gonna cost going forward. Number two, I think our issue our challenge, our financial challenge with the institutions in this town that are able to survive under the guise of education. And let's, let's be honest about this. They're in the business of education. It's a billion dollar business. You don't get to go build the athletic field that was built on five and 10 if you're a struggling school. I don't see that kind of field being built at Frontier. When you've got that kind of money to build that kind of a field and you're educating your students and you're probably teaching them about um, social responsibility and equity and financial responsibility and taking care of others, let's look at home first. We're a community and it, we may not appear to be struggling. We heard financially we're struggling. Yes, we and it's time for those who are taking advantage of the services of the town I'm not looking for anything beyond what's fair. Let's come up with a fair number and let's ask those folks no more that we have to pay for these kids who come to our school. All we want you to do is take some of that revenue that you're generating and pay for your children that are coming to our school. Unfortunately, because we're a public entity, we're not in business. Whereas because they're a private entity, they are in business. And I know they've done things for the town South County EMS is benefited by a building that was graciously donated and built by Deerfield Academy, and we're grateful for that. I'm not looking a gift horse in the mouth. All I want is what's fair. Pay us the value of the education for the children that you send to these schools because you've taken that real estate off the books, and we can't adequate, adequately collect the tax dollars necessary. The burden is shared among all the taxpayers in the town of Deerfield to educate kids, whether you have kids in school or not. I have a daughter who's now in college that I'm now paying for, but I still pay my taxes in town to educate my neighbor's kids. Yet the largest tax base in this town, the largest single tax base in this town is exempt. They take advantage of it and they're not paying their fair share into it. The other piece about school choice I appreciate the honest explanation, if school choice isn't going to change, we need to petition the legislature to change the way school choice works. Take the cost for those students, charge it back to the communities where they're coming from, and that will entice those communities to up their educational standards, and the rising tide will lift all boats. 
Why should we have to suffer? And I, I understand if there's a couple seats here, we can make it. But then we've got those same children that now go to Frontier and affect our number on Frontier. If those children decide to go to Smith Volk, now we're paying to send them to Smith Volk and transport them to Smith Volk. Uh, not the school choice kids. Oh, not them? Okay. No. Then I stand corrected. Yeah. No, it's just Deerfield resident kids okay. that, go to, that we pay for Smith I stand Volk. corrected then. I apologize. And, and we do really do check every year to make sure the kids stay enrolled in the program that they originally went to Smith Volk for. Because a few years back, I don't know if you remember the discussion, we discovered that you know, kids changed out of programs and they stayed at Smith Volk. So we we do check and make sure they stayed enrolled in like the agricultural program or whatever um, that is not offered at Franklin Tech. Okay. I appreciate that information. Thank yeah. you. No, that's Thanks good. for correcting me. Mm -hmm. um, and you do raise a good point too. I mean, we were assuming that uh, the students from nonprofits are all going to go to our school, but if they go to Smith Volk, they're still a Deerfield child and they're still going to be paying the full freight. And so maybe we're in worse shape than we think we are on that score. What, but I didn't realize that we also, um, Deerfield, if Deerfield Academy's kids, uh, faculty kids go to a charter school, we also pay. And, and we do have kids at charter school that we pay for. Right. I, I discovered that yeah. through it's the, the pandemic. It's the gift that keeps giving. Right. Mm -hmm. Lots of schools and not enough students to fill any of them, you know, so it's a problem. Yeah. Right. Uh, Jeff, you asked about South County EMS and hoping we get to revenue neutral. Look, we would love nothing more than to get there. Honestly, as I sit here today, I don't personally don't believe we'll ever get there. I think we'll generate more revenue with some of the programs that are coming. Right. But just just to put some of this stuff into scope, we're at about getting close to that 10 year mark. So we've had to replace a good deal of equipment that we initially took in. We're still running one of the older ambulances that we had when we took this over. And the cost of ambulances, I remember when I started as a director, it was about $135,000 a year. Those ambulances are approaching $300,000 a year. More than that. 400. That's 375. Was 375. That was the last one. If there's a silver lining in this last two budget cycles for scams, it's that we have put aside the money, I, I believe, for the next um, the next $375,000 ambulance. I'm not sure if that is is all in. It's, it's been a little bit. Is the money portioned? It's there, Yeah, right? yeah it's there. So We're in the waiting list for it. So. so while that has all happened, we, South County EMS, has not seen that type of increase in what we're able to bill and receive right. from patients. So we're in one of those declining, no more than the police. Police cruiser went from 55 to 65 this year. If you go back eight or 10 years, it was probably a $35,000 vehicle. Yep. And again, the cost on the police for training and what they need to do, look at what a policeman wears going out the door today. Tasers and cameras and, and all the equipment that they need to try to stay connected and do what they need to do. So all these costs have increased Yet we're not getting the additional revenue to offset those costs. The good news is we are providing more service, better service at a higher level. So hopefully those people who are calling and need an ambulance are going to get that level of care sooner and a higher level so that their outcomes are better and they get home quicker when they do have to be hospitalized. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Matt. Okay, so Article 10 is the Sewer Enterprise Fund funding article, and it reflects, so the revenue expense balance each other. You'll notice that total revenues meets total enterprise fund expenses. It reflects a modest increase in sewer rates. Um, there are a few things that did go up. We certainly have to take care of debt service for the upgrades project down at the South Deerfield plant. And that's a piece of that, but as all as everyone should remember, seventy five percent of that cost comes out of sewer, and twenty five is paid from the entire general fund budget. So that cost is split. Um, what did I forget, Brenda? That's it. 
we should see some leveling off now that we're getting towards the tail end of that project. And that project should be substantially complete by May and hopefully fully complete by June. Skip staring at me. Okay. I have a table that follows this, but this is the article request and this is South County Emergency Medical Services, um, the enterprise fund funding source. And so the reason that the table is on the next page is it's much longer. So what you see here is revenues and expenses plus the breakout for informational purposes of what each town pays plus the anticipated revenue coming in related to the total expenses. Um, and frankly, I think that maybe Tim and Carolyn can answer this a little bit better than I, or can address it a little bit better than I can. What am Although I... Matt's still here. Matt's, Matt's, Matt's a good here. source as well. I, I mean, what do we what do we need to address? So here? essentially, revenues include your medical service fees, your CPE fund reimbursements, retained earnings, and then that all equals a total. But we also have to include in what the assessment from Deerfield, Sunderland, and Waitley will be. Right. Um, in this case, we don't have any other funds funding our request. So your total revenues are one one million seven hundred eighty three thousand four hundred ninety seven dollars. And your total expenses, again, this is an enterprise fund, so those things have to balance. So your salaries and wages are $1,464,664. Operating expenses are $252,333. Indirect costs are $66,500 with a total enterprise fund expense line of $1,783,497. And so as you get to the tail end of that table, you will see the Deerfield allocated share of expenses, which is paid from free cash as Julie discussed earlier. And the cost that we're looking at is $444,368. Um, as you get further down into the table, you do see where the revenues are balancing those expenses through the assessments. Um, Sunderland pays 31%, Wheatley pays 16%, and Deerfield pays 51%. I will go to article 12. So related, we the board was making an effort to keep things related, related items together. So you'll see we have the SCEMS capital improvement, South County EMS capital improvements. Um, the total we're looking at is $105,000. And these are for FY24 capital improvements, which are reevaluations based on some needs that we had, but didn't know we needed. Um, so we have three projects. We have a station alert system, paramedic intercept electric vehicle, and a paramedic intercept EV charger that goes with that electric vehicle. Julie mentioned this earlier. Um, the alert system is a $30,000 cost. And the funding source for that is a reallocation of the exhaust project, which was approved several years ago. Um, in fact, South County EMS received a uh, gift i think you can correct me if i'm wrong but no it was a gift from the greenfield it was a gift department. from greenfield for an exhaust system so this gives us the ability to reallocate those funds for a station alert system to better make sure that everybody in the in the station can respond quickly to requests for service um the second piece of this is the paramedic intercept electrical vehicle um so you'll see there's $16,000 being allocated from retained earnings, but the bulk of the money for the $60,000 vehicle is a reallocation of the cardiac monitor project. The town obtained, and it was through the good work of one of the paramedics in the office, Lori McComb, put out a grant to get one of the cardiac monitors through the federal government and she did receive it. So we were able to obtain that, um, which meant the total allocation for the cardiac monitor, which what project, which was approved last year, left us $44,000. So we're in a good position to reallocate, to meet a need that we have right now. 
Um, and then the last piece of this is the paramedic intercept EV charger. So along with the electric vehicle, you need the charging system. And the charging system is directly related to the building itself. Um, we're, meeting, we're meeting two needs here. We are trying to meet the climate resiliency needs of stepping away from as many gas, gas vehicles, but also to do that by using electrical vehicles, there's some infrastructure needs and this is one of them. So the allocation is from rent stabilization. Did I miss anything? No. Okay. no. And one thing I will alert everyone to, because one of these sources is retained earnings, this entire article requires a two thirds majority vote. I'm sorry, stabilization. The rent stabilization, sorry, I was looking at the wrong column. Okay, Article 13. This is the full-on capital improvements plan. And you'll notice, and Julie, take a look at this. Um, there's a little notation in here. The Finance Committee didn't fully recommend the article, but they recommended specific projects. So in this, you will see that there are highlighted specific projects that, cap that finance approved. Um, and Julie can tell me to change that if she wants. But we're looking at 179,600. I will tell you from experience, capital spent a lot of time going over this. And this was a big discussion last night at the select board hearing or the select board meeting and hearing. Um, there were a lot of things that came across the table, but because we have other stressors on the budget, there was some decision-making that had to be done. And so the projects you see here are an air conditioning phase two, for the elementary school. We have a server replacement here in the municipal offices because ours has reached its useful life. Um, there is the sewer wastewater treatment facility truck replacement, and that is to provide a vehicle that can allow that department to do their own snow removal. We have a replacement stretcher for South County EMS, and we also have that senior center van for 12,500, which is the portion that Deerfield would pay. So the total we're looking at is $179,600 and it's coming from the various sources. That's one of the reasons you see this table and this table will be in the warrant so people can identify what we're paying things out of. But I will say, I heard both Mark and Carolyn say last night, Mark Brennan is the chair of capital say that it was a difficult thing to make decisions on and then send those decisions on to finance and the select board because there was quite a bit of discussion amongst all three groups. I, I would just like to add that we've agreed to work over the summer uh, on the capital committee and come up with a 15 year plan which would incorporate um, the rest of the road repairs that are needful and give it a rough estimate of our needs based on the potential for grants, um, the rural um, mass works grants that will be effective on River Road, the EWP grants that will be effective for Little Meadow Road, Depot Road, and McCollum Farm Road. All right. Let me just have one, sure. one question. Um, Thank you, Carolyn. As part of the process this coming summer um, to develop a 15-year capital plan, will part of that be to develop a pavement management plan so that roads truly can be prioritized for we have upgrades? A, we have a pavement management plan. Yeah, but yeah, you, you said it's but really not. It, the problem is it's um, several years old and it doesn't take into account climate change. Yeah. Um, so it was based on a 15 year uh, replacement for, for pavement, but um, with climate change, you know, uh, frost, warm, you know, uh, winters that we've been having and experienced, the, the pavement is just cracking. So, so what we were going to do is try to get it updated because the inf basic information is correct. But what we, um, I have been working with the um, Mass Highway Association. It's all the highway departments mm -hmm. that belong to that. Mm -hmm. And there is a factor that you can take rather than pay for a whole new plan because it's like a $50,000 plan. Mm -hmm. uh, what you can do is take a factor 
that they use, you can take your original plan that is based on the 15 year replacement and then just cycle through the factor based on a seven or an eight year plan. And that will give you the same rotation, but at a you know seven or eight year rate. I um, I don't quite know the formula. It's just, you know, I have- uh, but, you know, but the important the thing is that when the 15 year capital plan is developed, there will be a oh, framework yes. in writing to identify the priority roads, road infrastructure, sidewalks. Right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. We, we are definitely going to do that because um, number one, it, it informs the, our residents when they're going to do the years because we save up our um, ch chapter 90 money, like for River Road. Um, and Lower Road, it was like th we saved three years in a row of our Chapter 90, and then we used it because it's slightly over a million dollars to do, you know, Lower Road. And I think it was slightly over a million dollars to do River Road. So it was, you know, years of saving our Chapter 90 money so that we could do that. And you could look at when your road is up based on the plan, because people always want to know when their roads are going to get paved. I don't want to. I really don't want to delay more. But I just, I just want to clarify that this will go beyond paving. This will go to roads that we've had deferred maintenance on for, you know, uh, seven decades, eight decades, and, and things like that. And it'll be prioritized to identify all that. Okay. Yeah. All right. Good. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, Article 14 is the recommendations from the Community Preservation Committee. At this point, what you see in these two tables is annual revenue appropriations, um, as well as the Community Preservation Reserve balances. So you'll see motions that include transfers to reserve for Community Preservation Historical, transfers to reserve for open space, transfers to reserve for community housing, the appropriation for administrative expenses, and the community preservation budgeted reserve. So as you'll know, the motions will say these same things, but the amount requested is identified plus the percentage of revenues for the first three. Um, what we're trying to do is give everybody as much information as possible. These tables will be in the warrant. And then, Usually people ask what the balances were as of the closure of the last fiscal year, which we've provided thanks to our town accountant. Um, and, the, and the only other thing I wanna add, this just refers to the amounts of our um, CPC C money. This is what we right. collect, not, not the state match. We have no idea what the state match will be. And currently there are no projects to be put forth just transfers to reserves and appropriation for administrative expenses. Just just a clarification. So uh, this is based on estimated revenues, including what we might get from the state. So um, that's always budgeted very conservatively. And so that 10% that goes into each of those reserves that's required is based on an estimate of, of everything. Yeah. Right. Article 15, this might be something that Jeff has a question about. So this article is a request to have the town vote to accept the provisions of chapter general law chapter 59, section 57C to establish a quarterly tax payment system to be effective July 1st, 2025, which is the beginning of fiscal year 2026. And I'm sure everybody has a lot of questions, but I'll give you the upshot. Right now, bills are sent twice a year. And typically, they, the first billing is in January, and then the second billing is May 1st. Um, these two large payments are made just four months apart, and no payments are made between May 1st and December. Um, the first half, so the first half due date is dependent on setting the tax rate. And in many cases, the town has struggled to have all that data ready to set the tax rate before November or December. We've watched it the past several years. And in our current situation, we need to have a better cash flow system. It's something that was identified 
very early on in this fiscal year, but we were aware could be hitting us long before that. And what we tried to do was mitigate those circumstances by asking for um, faster movement on some of the stuff that, just the background work that has to happen. Um, changing to quarterly was, would result in better certainty, greater certainty. Due dates would never change. Your due dates would be August 1st, November 1st, February 1st, and May 1st. You'd have four smaller payments made equally during the year. Um, the first and second quarters are preliminary estimate, which is typically 50% of the previous fiscal year total. The third and fourth quarters are actual payments. And so once the tax rate set, those total amounts minus the preliminary amount is divided equally for those last two payments. Um, what this results in is it's more even income for the tenant. Deerfield heavily re relies on its revenues um, from taxes to cover accounts payable and payroll warrants. And so this year we, we saw this happen in real time. So this, it, this time frame between May 1st and December 31st is that period where we haven't collected money. So this change would allow us to even that out. It also allows taxpayers to even their payments out. Um, it would, so the treasurer also can take advantage of longer yields on CDs and investment services and not worry about running accounts dry, which does happen. Um, and then there could be a significant reduction of costly municipal borrowing in anticipation of tax revenue. It doesn't happen all the time, but it does happen occasionally. Um, the initial transition was one of the things that the select board brought to my attention many months ago when they first discussed this with the assessors in December. And that that's the, probably the toughest hurdle to get over because you would have FY25 second half due on May 1st, and then FY26 first quarter would be due August 1st. Um, but smaller payments would then equally spread things out. Um, the other thing is, is if we do this as of fiscal 26, it gives a year for property owners to prepare financially. Um, we plan to send notices and educational pieces out to residents so that they're aware of this. Um, certainly that information will be displayed on the website as well. Um, we don't expect additional costs to transition to a quarterly billing process in our software system, so software. Um, we will see approximately $1,000 in additional paper and postage increases, but we will spread some of those costs with the district because the districts also utilize our system to send their taxes out. So all in all, we think it's going to be a more stable cash flow situation. We also think it will help the residents plan a little better how they want to pay things and how they want to, you know, reflect that on their own taxes. All right, I'll move on. Article 16, this article was submitted by the library trustees and the article is to request that the Tilton Meyer Library file a petition with Franklin County Probate and Family Court or as an alternative, the Supreme Judicial Court to seek certain modifications of the testamentary charitable trust of Chauncey B. Tilton and ratification of past actions of the trustees. Certain actions taken, the, also certain actions taken, taken by the Tilton Library Inc. <coughs> last Tilton Fund Inc. in conjunction with the trustees. There is a sum summary that we are gonna provide to everybody and it was provided when we first had these conversations. Um, it has been filed with the clerk's office so that if anybody wants to come in and see it, you could certainly do that next, you know, as soon as we're open. Um, but these past actions are in I can't talk. connection with the operation and management of the Tilton Library itself. And the intent is to separate the library trustees and the Tilton Fund Incorporated, as well as the membership thereof. Um, this part of the request is to authorize the select board to enter into and approve any necessary filings 
to accomplish all of what this request is. And I won't promise you that I can explain this very well, except to say that they are trying to correct actions that had happened in the past and make sure that they're moving ahead with a framework that is clear and, and separate. So we will have that letter available for you. I just didn't get a chance to put it up on the website. It is at the clerk's office, so we can try to get that out to people. Um, it'll be in the guide, it won't be in the warrant. Article 17 is a request to amend the Deerfield General Bylaws section 1022, which is Community Preservation Committee as follows, with added text noted in bold and underline and deletions noted in strike through. So I won't go through the entire thing, but essentially this is a membership change and it is a membership change to solve a problem that we have. And I think maybe Tim and Carolyn can explain it a little bit better than I can. So um, CPA is a state bylaw uh, that communities adopted when they wanted to uh, take part in the Community Preservation Act system. Um, one of the stipulations was that uh, you need, because uh, one of the primary goals of CPA is to generate uh, revenue toward community housing projects, uh, the state in its wisdom wrote a bylaw that said, you need to have a member from your housing authority. Deerfield doesn't have a housing authority. So therefore we are always one member short because we're not allowed to appoint a member who has an interest in housing. And um, the only housing authority that is around here is not in our town, and those people are not Deerfield residents. We don't have a Deerfield resident on, on a local housing authority. So what's proposed and what's been adopted in other communities that have the same problem was to change the bylaw and say that you, uh, the select board will have the ability to appoint one person who will represent the interests of uh, community housing projects. Um, and so that's really the only change here other than the numbering, I think. Other than the numbering, yes. And we, we continue to have a problem with um, the recreation department uh, not uh, having a member who consistently comes to meetings. And so the, the, the impetus of this is to try and make sure that there are no quorum problems when the CPA is meet, having its meetings. Uh, so. And there is a notation that you'll see in the warrant that says the revisions to the bylaw are intended to update the statutory reference because a lot of these members, with the exception of the last two, they're all statutory and those can't change. So we were trying and other communities have been trying to figure out how to be able to have some local voice in this particular um, committee. Yeah, it's a state requirement that we yeah. we can never meet. So um, it's a way for us to address a thing that's probably makes perfect sense in a large community that has a housing authority, but in a rural community with 5,000 people, it makes no sense. And, and I believe that the, the, the town has no interest in running a housing authority or running no. rental properties. That's for the private sector. And uh, so this will be a good solution for this problem. Article 18 is a request to obtain permission from town meeting to dispose of a parcel of land. And that is map 169, lot 186. It's actually the red barn behind the former Alice property, before the, the Alice house itself. Um, so the chain, the request here is from municipal general municipal purposes to land for disposition that's the purpose um and to authorize the select board to convey sell or otherwise dispose of said parcel and authorize the select board to enter into and negotiate all the necessary documents so essentially we're asking for permission to dispose of that piece of land um there is a process by which we dispose of any piece of land and that's in the procurement requirements so it would be a formal um transparent and published process, land disposition process. And additionally, um, the reason behind this is because New Pro has expressed interest in purchasing the land. Um, we can't sell it to them or negotiate with them about it because it has to change status. 
there's also a question of the the building that we're using to house DPW equipment. Um, and so we want to be able to both negotiate with New Pro about selling the land and putting it back on the tax rolls and also uh, negotiate with them about we need to have a replacement building where this other equipment can be stored. So um, that's where where we hope to go with this. Julie has a question. Go ahead, Julie. Yeah, I, uh, I'm not familiar with um, where this piece of property is. So could you just um, describe that a little bit more in detail, please? It's actually a piece of property. I don't know if everybody knows where the old Jewett property was. So if you look, if you drive down Sugarloaf Street towards the mountain, it's on your right-hand side. It's a small red barn. Um, and it's actually between the new site of New Pro and Sugarloaf Street. Um, and you can certainly look this up in the assessor's records online on the town's website. Um, and the search term I would use is map 169, lot 186, and it's literally 169-186 if you want to look at a piece of what that property looks like. And Julie, if you're familiar with Merrigan Way, if you turn onto Merrigan Way and look to your right, you'll see a little red building, and that's approximately where the land is. But yeah. It's just identified as Jewett Ave, which is which used to be the um, access point for the old highway garage. Great, thank you. All right. Article 19. This is a request to appropriate and transfer from general stabilization or otherwise provide $600,000 to fund extraordinary road and sidewalk reconstruction and repairs and for all the costs related to and incidental, including en engineering and design. And I will let the board discuss this. Um, this is a shortfall that we're faced with um, uh, after the state um, has made a payment to us for $1,000,000. $580,000. We still have outstanding bills. I'm not sure if we have all the ones from Hawks Road yet. I believe we just we just received another one from Hawks Road. Um, or maybe that was Hoosick Road. And I don't think we have everything for Hawks Road yet. But right now we're at a spend of about 475000 if I've calculated correctly, um, with more bills to come in. Yeah, we we think this six hundred thousand is going to cover it, but um, as Brenda said, we'll have more information for the town meeting. Hopefully, we'll receive more bills. Yes. Yeah, so, in a context, we've spent about two million three hundred sixty thousand dollars. That's our target number at this point. I, with some of the bills that Brenda's referencing that have to come in, we received one point five eight million from the state. There's a gap of a little less than $800,000. We have a fund of $260,000 from a previous um, road- S Storm event. Storm events. From July of 21. We'll, we'll yeah. use approximately $200,000 of that money. And then there's a gap of approximately 600,000 um, rather than be in a position of, this may be a little more than we'll spend, uh, but it would leave money for engineering work to actually look at real fixes to River Road. We've made emergency repairs to River Road and other roads. So this will allow us to cancel all of the expenditures we had on the storm damage. And and the hope is that we'll still get another uh, round of payment from the state. Um, there's still $5 million that they haven't um, expended. And the idea is that but we have to pay off, obviously, we have to pay off these bills by June 30th. So um, the appeal, Lemonster is appealing the FEMA denial, and um, that will hopefully come in before September. But whatever money we don't spend um, in the transfer will revert to free cash. OK, question. <laughs> um, Casey, just a, a couple of little, I think, typos in the article that the town council might want to take a look at, where you're identifying a specific funding source. 
But my question is um, regarding this article, is there going to be something at town meeting that outlines what the total costs were or the estimated total costs are and the funding sources that are going to go to pay off the cost, not just the stabilization, but the various different funding sources from the state and from the other, the other special revenue fund? I can certainly do that if, if, um, I think it's a logical thing to do. Yeah. You yeah. know, okay. to have a little, we're, yeah. we're hoping to have a total. I mean, we were supposed to have a total at the end of March, but, um, we had, you know, because of the weather, we had so much rain, the, the it delayed a little bit on Hawks road. And okay. so they're still working okay. as, as we're speaking right now. Okay. And then one last question. Um, oh, well, actually I think it's a comment. Um, the finance committee just briefly discussed the 600,000 to be used from general stabilization. And I'm just gonna give my own personal opinion. I think general stabilization will absolutely need to be replenished, whether it's through the state, if they come through with more funds or whether it's from our free cash next year because drawing down stabilization is not entirely good for our credit rating. <laughs> Thank you. We're, we're hoping, Margaret, we're hoping to put money back into the stabilization in the October meeting. That's that's fabulous. Thank yeah. You. And I think if we're developing, um, you know, the expense and and the sources of revenue to pay pay off this debt, we may want to reference the fact that there's approximately 1.4 million dollars in general stabilization, and we're looking at taking it down to about 800 thousand, and with the goal of replenishing it. Yeah. And yes, Margaret, I actually got late in the day, I got a change from council. So I'm finishing that up because there's actually, a, we actually have to do something little, a little tweaky piece of language change in there, but I didn't have a chance to add it all. Okay, article 20, should article 19 pass? Um, I'll let the board take this one. Well, if if the article 19 passes, then we will cover all our current emergency expenses. And so therefore we'll rescind the entire $5 million of um, borrowing, authority. borrowing authority because we're you know able to do it through the stabilization and the state payment and, and the fund that we had from July 21 storm left over. Cancel it. Cancel it. Right. Yes. Yeah. Cancel it. Right. Completely gone. Yeah. Completely take care of it. Yeah. Right. Well, we well, actually did because we didn't know we were going to get 1.58 million the next day. And actually, the quarterly tax payments might have helped us as well because what we were experiencing was a sort of like a cash flow problem. We didn't have money to pay bills. Is that correct? It was the, it was the perfect storm. So if we had had quarterly payments, we might've had enough cash flow if we knew in advance that we were gonna get state money. Um, and we probably, but for the fact that MEMA helped us develop a $4.8 million damage estimate of emergency repairs that were needed, we had to sort of use the similar figure, figure to ask the state or ask the, the, the state, we were asking the state based on 4.8 million and we were asking the residents based on the MEMA estimates so, you know, that's where the $5 million figure came from. And I'm just really happy that uh, state came through and we have enough money in our stabilization fund and we had some extra money from a previous storm so that we can deal with this. I mean, we're still hustling for money constantly and we're, you know, asking for more state help. And what we're doing now is documenting all these events. So if the disaster bill gets passed, then we can put in, because you don't need to have a declared event, you just need an event. So hopefully then we can claim damages that um, occur as they come with these storm events. But unfortunately, um, you know, we had this all at once. So we weren't able to get a, like apply to the EWP program because that application has to be in with in, within 60 days and, you know, that kind of stuff. So, um, the going forward, the I mean, what we've repaired has been upgraded and has been wonderful through um, like the December 18th event, which we had five and a quarter inches of rain. Um, and so we, we've truly had more than $20 million worth of repair work done for this 
less than 2.4 million. So it's been pretty fabulous, actually. Um, if you look at the upside of it, <laughs> the upside is that we're better prepared. And one thing that I think is is easy for everyone to see is um, if you go talk to Kathy at Richardson's, she will tell you how amazed she is with the the work that uh, Chief Pachark and the DPW were able to arrange just near her property. They put in 60-inch culverts to replace like 24-inch culverts that always jammed up. I don't think there's been um, flooding at that place that we used to drive through ponds on a regular basis, even in a light rainstorm, and the water's flowing out through the, the is it the former Savage Farm property? Yeah. Well, Williams's. Williams's um, towards uh, the Deerfield, and uh, you know, she's ecstatic. Wapping Road is draining, which, um, you know, the septic systems there of the people that lived in the area were really threatened. So we're moving the water um, through there instead of backing up. So people's septic systems are not in failure right now. So there, there are positive things. Is there a lot of work left? Yes. Um, you know, River Road is stabilized, but it's not been repaired. Um, like I said, we still have roads closed and we have single lane roads still. But, um, you know, we have plans uh, to figure out how to do it through grants, which was normally what we do over the years. We've, we've done our road work repairs through grants, but it just was so overwhelming and so many roads that they're just, we had no choice but to do the emergency repairs. People uh -huh. had to get to their houses, basically. Pretty hideous. Okay, so our last article. Yes, folks, we only have 21 articles. Um, this last article is a citizen petition, and that is voting rights for 16 and older citizens. So it's a request to the town to authorize and request the select board to petition the general court for a home rule legislation to allow any citizens in the town of Deerfield, uh, notwithstanding general laws 51, section one and sections 47A, who have reached the age of 16 or older to register and vote in municipal elections within the town of Deerfield. Again, this is a citizen's petition, um, formally sent through with signature certification and review by council. Um, the board included it in the warrant and the board won't necessarily speak to it. The citizens, we've already contacted the people that were talking to us about it and indicated to them that they need to work with the moderator and um, set up how they want to frame information with attendees at town meeting. Oh Charlie yeah. Blake, uh, Charlene. Yeah. Charlene, just, just make sure you use the mic. Yeah. Oh, no, I the mic that works. I have a strong voice. Um, first I learned about it was last night and I, I really was sh surprised and I'll use the word shocked that this is even being presented and I understand it it was all done legally but um I'm I I there's no one here to address why they decided to put so there's no ex I I was hoping to hear an explanation you will see information at the town meeting okay yeah. well that uh, K Casey did ask Jessica Cor Corwin Corwin yeah to to give oh, us some good. information I, I I'm I'm in awe of why this is even an article um because I, I did I went online to look at some statistics just to see where we are with mental health with young children. And um, I found a national leading mental health agency, MHA, that gave some pretty strong um, data. 16% of ages of children aged 12 to 17, which means about 4 million adult, um, adolescents have had one major depressive episode in 2022, 16%. 10% of children 6 to 16 have a clinically diagnosed mental problem. 70% of children and adolescents who have mental health problems have never gone for appropriate intervention. And 50% of mental health problems are usually established by the age of 14 
and 75% are established by the age of 24. When I saw those statistics, I'm thinking of 16-year-olds voting, and I feel so strong that we, before they can vote, let's address the mental health problems that exist in this country. And there, I think we've seen it with some even recent information about our school, our high school um, recently, which you know I don't want to go into in any way. But I'm just saying there are issues that are out there, and it's hard for me to understand how we could even consider doing this because um, I know the school is doing, uh, has programs existed now. Um, they have a restorative practice, social, emotional program going on in the school. They have a, a culturally responsive teaching and learning program going on, which basically says they know there are situations for children in um, the schools that they're trying to address to help the children. And then um, some of the stressors that add to this, you have bullying, which can be a huge, there are eight stressors that I found. There's bullying, there's um, difficult, if a child has difficulty in school and discrimination. And we know those three things are part of schools, not just here, but in a lot of schools. So to know we're going to ask 16 year olds to vote on serious financial matters for a town, knowing that they have complicated lives already with so many different stressors in their lives is, I just don't think a good move on our part as a town. I'm sure it will pass, everything passes at town meeting. I mean, we're all kind of giggling about it, but it's this isn't funny to me, this is serious. And, and I, think that would be I will try to speak on that at that, yeah. you know, not that, and I'm sure it'll go nowhere, but I will at least feel I did my part as a human being, that but um, absolutely the purpose. you know, I'm just, I really, and I know because Kids are driving, they're responsible. But again, that is one of their biggest steps in their life as a 16-year-old. But never mind throw in voting. And then you, you know, it's going to be known that a 16-year-old who hasn't done their homework on what's being voted on, they're going to look for their parents. So you're going to just basically get another vote from the family household. So it just doesn't seem like the right move right now. Um, I think COVID brought a huge uh, change in children's lives and we're still recuperating from it. And I just hope, I hope our townspeople who are voting that day can think seriously and then vote however they feel. But I, I know it's just, it's a very serious thing for me right now to think this might even pass. So that's my point. But this is, yeah, this is a citizen's petition. You will see more information yeah. there. Yeah, thank you. Did you want to speak, Blake? I just uh, wanted to know if there was anybody in the town government that's endorsing this. I don't think we all have enough information, truthfully. Okay. So you know, I mean, there's, there's not, no recommendation from the finance committee. Yeah, there's the no finance recommendation from the select board. Did, didn't recommend you, it. You know, you 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 voted it down. I'm sorry. It was it was oh. it was two 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 in favor on the finance committee and four not on. Yeah. So they did. What about the school committee? I, I don't think they've, they normally don't weigh in, but. This would be a situation for them to weigh in, I would think. Yeah, I would not be surprised that this doesn't pass, right. personally, but. I think uh, that everybody that I've spoken to is definitely against and, this. And what yeah, people need to understand is the select board's not all powerful, right? Yeah. I mean, when there are petition processes that are followed correctly by citizens, then you put something on a warrant. Doesn't mean you support it. Doesn't mean you think it's a good idea. Right. It means that the citizens followed the law, and then you let they them have the they have, have really enough signatures. Right. And it, that's it was, what surprises me. Well, I think from I'm not I'm not defending this, but where I think this is coming from is that they are trying to get kids socially engaged. Uh, you know, you had the. Perfect explanation. What is happening out of COVID? There's huge mental health issues that are not being addressed. The schools are doing as best they can. They do have programs that are addressing some of this stuff. There's huge pressure from social media and kids are feeling very isolated. So what they're trying to do, it just like 
I've been trying to work with Deerfield 2030 and engage people with yard by yard and trying to empower people to feel not overwhelmed by climate change. This, I think this is where this is coming from, is they're trying to engage kids in the civic um, government and, and volunteerism again and trying to participate in the community after being so isolated. That is where I think this is coming from. And it doesn't, even if we approve it, it doesn't mean it's going to happen because what, what it has to do is it has to go through the legislature. And so the finance committee was looking at it as if the legislature approved this, there is a cost to this and it definitely does because if the you would have to have rent separate ballot machines if there was you know state and federal election versus on the same date as a, as a local election so there are, there are costs to this but i you know again i think people are just trying to find ways for you know kids to connect and to feel participatory in their community because, you know, after being yep. shut down with COVID, there's less volunteerism, there's less, you know. But to answer your question, the select board is not taking a position on this. And also, um, Prop 2 and a half, I think, came out of a petition. And so, you know, sometimes good ideas come out of petitions and sometimes crazy ideas come out of petitions. And um, so, you know, we're just following what right. we've been told is the requirement. I think, I think what you said, Carolyn, was the fact that there's a lack of community service amongst the young people. And maybe as adults, we should be starting to think out of, outside the box on getting them back reconnected. But this is not one of those that they should be doing. Thank you. Yep. All right. I think that concludes the information session. I have a couple of questions for the select board. Is there um, is there anyone that had questions on the um that is in the audience? Pam, did you have any more questions or Julie or, or Susan. Susan? I see Susan was really paying attention through the whole session. And if you don't have any questions, we're perfectly happy to not continue this meeting. <laughs> <laughs> this is their third meeting in a row. <laughs> You were, yeah, it's you get three or four meetings a week. You get kind of burned out in the evening. But you, anyway, thank you, everybody. I shall. Thank you. Um, I'm on the boo, yes. Oh, sure. sure. Um, I'll take a motion to adjoin. Sure. No, do you need us? I need one yeah, thing. We, oh, we, okay, go ahead. There is, there is actually a vote that we didn't take last night that we discussed. No, Charlene, it's fine. We're going to go home. My husband had a serious medical thing happen in early February. Zero one three seven three. The ambulance went to the They couldn't find the ambulance. And one of my sister and her sister got back. Yep. My mom got back. So mm -hmm. I said, Where are they? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Went to the police station. Mm -hmm. they, they went to trouble they with GPS because part of the zero one three seven three on River Road, yep. that's where they went. Oh my gosh, Charlene. Oh, this is one of the things that our new chief is through the first alert system. He's made a request. Well, you know, the chief's there. They had such an issue with 911 nine calls my first year that I lived up yeah. there. Um, they had an ambulance with a full saying, if somebody had called in and with a heart attack, please tell us where you are. We could not find it. Poor guy was on the other side of the, of the lake. And so they even did all the streets just to make it easier. But if you could. Yeah, there is a very the, That first here. alert. Is supposed to come up on the on the uh, in the station. It will come up on a big screen. That's what that alert so system is the for. Address is. No, no. This, no, no, this is this is they're going to get a new alert system inside the uh, EMS building. That's one of the capital it's, projects. It ties into the, the the computers inside the ambulance. It ties into the 
computer. That's how it picked up had to be yeah. the people. They couldn't apologize. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. I think your portion of it may be over. Yeah, yours is. Yeah, so that was good for no. you. Good work. I'll see you Yeah, absolutely. A Matt. Yeah, yeah. He is the easy other beer film representative. So. Absolutely. Yeah, well. That was, what, that was our that was the new um, director's suggestion, I think. Yes. Yeah. Was yeah. to do that and avoid the, those issues. But yeah. I also yeah. have so I'm really sorry. Really sorry. Yeah. But it wouldn't happen, I don't think. Yeah. We will. Because Possibly. I'm it was our own work. Yeah. Statement. I'm mainly going to let the other yeah. staff member that yeah. needs to meet with them meet with them. Yeah. 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 Listen, thank you, Charlene. Yeah. I'm sorry thank about you. that. Yes, so we had an we had an item we didn't actually vote last night. Um, it was the contract for the um, library, for the construction contract. Mm -hmm. Has the town administrator listed as the authorized signatory? So I wanted I brought it up at the beginning of the meeting, but we didn't circle back around to it. Um, how do you want to handle that? Do you want to authorize? the town administrator to do that via a vote or do you want to change the authorized signatory to be a member of the select board? Fine. If we authorize, vote on Works for me. I just have to find it. I'll make a motion to um, authorize the town administrator to sign the uh, Tilton Library construction contract. And I will second that. All those in favor? GI. Carolyn Nessai. Thank okay. you. Thank so. you. Papers? I don't, but I'll get them while you guys think about it. Um, so we can adjourn? Yeah. Okay, I'll make I'll, a motion to adjourn. I'll second. All those in favor? Tim Hill, GI. Carolyn Nessai.